The Bible witness have managed to get this scripture in song, the volume one, which was published in 2005. Uh, and we have actually uh, duplicated it again, and uh, a thousand copy has been, uh, a thousand copies of this have been uh, produced. And because we have received many, many requests for this. And so, um, of course, there are much production costs. So it's available today for $10. Uh, there is a DVD for children. There's a scripture in song and also an audio CD. There are two, so two things inside, a DVD as well as an audio DVD, which you can play, play in your car or vehicle when you travel. And it's a good gift for Christmas, especially to children. So if you want to buy this today, maybe about 50 copies will be available. So go and grab it if you, can, if you like it. But if you need more, please let uh, Deacon Locke know. And also pray that the second volume of this is now being uh, uh, created. Uh, pray for those who are in Bible Witness Media Ministry and our children and even parents who are involved in the production of the second DVD, uh, which we pray that the Lord will help us to make available to you by Christmas. And so... Thank God for our children's labor. <clears throat> Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. I would also like to announce uh, about my preaching that, God willing, two weeks from now, or two weeks later, rather, uh, I will start a new series from the book of Haggai, and God willing, after that, from the book of Zechariah. So there will be a series of sermons from Haggai and Zechariah. And so please pray for me. I'll be preparing. And uh, next two Sundays, I will not be on this pulpit uh, because uh, I have to fulfill some of my brotherly duties to our sister churches. Uh, I've been uh, asked to preach in the last few months, but I postponed because I wanted to be with you and complete First Thessalonians. So having done that, I will take uh, two Sundays to minister to others. But I will be here uh, in Singapore only uh, for a day and a night. I will be away in KL to minister to Calvary Jair. So next two Lord's Days, we will have our own preachers ministering to you. Um, and uh, this afternoon, I also wanted to let you know, I will not be around to teach the Sunday School uh, for the adults, but the message uh, is video recorded. And so you will be able to listen to the video recording of the Bible study. So stay back, youths and adults, for the Bible study. And the next two weeks, I'll be asking preacher Jeremiah to take the Sunday school for the adults. All right. So today we are going to Consider Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. And this is a very special passage that the Lord has stirred Apostle Paul to write to the church in Philippi that the church in its entirety may remember their calling and thankfully serve the Lord. So in Philippians 1 verses 1 to 6, Apostle Paul addresses both the leaders as well as the church. So let me read to you this passage. Follow along in your Bibles. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, 
that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is a very special body of people like no other in the world. Nothing, no institution, no organization, no society is meant to be like the church. And that would mean that the church has nothing in this world to pattern after. Whether it's leadership, or its membership, or its activities, all are to be distinct. In fact, it should be so distinct that it should outshine everything else in this world. The pattern by which the church should function is given to us from heaven by God. Why? Because this is the only institution that God claims on this earth to be His. Where He exercises or He seeks to exercise His absolute sovereignty. Where He expects everyone to submit in total faith. He doesn't seek that in governments. Yes, God is sovereign about governments, but he, do, he doesn't force anyone to obey his Ten Commandments there. He doesn't preach to them. If they have to hear the Ten Commandments, they need to come where? To the church. The universities of this world will not teach them the things of God. It is only in the church the world can ever hear the truth of God. So church is an outstanding place. It's an outstanding gathering of God's people where God exercises His good will and good pleasure and all of us who gather in the church must be delighted that God has called us to manifest His wisdom, to manifest His power, to manifest His glory through us. Before we go through this passage, may I take your attention for a very brief Time to the ep epistle that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, chapter 1 and verses 22 to 23. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, where you will see that church is very special. Verse 22 and 23 of Ephesians 1. And hath put all things under his feet. And now this is about Jesus' resurrection and ascension. As he ascended to heaven, God the Father put all things under the feet of Christ. In other words, Jesus reigns as supreme king today from heaven. Okay, then watch the rest. And gave him, that means gave Jesus Christ, to be the head over all things to the church. Jesus Christ, the exalted one, rules over the church. He takes joy in telling you and me, I'm your king. I'm your head. You who gathered 
at my feet, you who sit at my footstool and look toward me to worship, know that I am your king. And then he says this in verse 23. Why is the Lord exercising authority over the church? Because he says we are his body, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You know why Jesus Christ is the head of the church? That all his fullness may run into us, the church. Anyone in this world who really want to see the glory of Jesus, they should look into the church. But unfortunately today, churches are busy to show off earthly glory. They speak much about their big buildings, state-of-art equipment. They speak much about the glamour, and uh, glory of this world. They take photographs of uh, very famous people, rich people who sit in the pews and put them up. And many of us would say, wow, look at the people in the church. But that is not what church is. When people look at our church, they must say, look at Jesus Christ. Look at Christ's wisdom. Look at Christ's power among them. Look at Jesus and his holiness in this people. Church is called that Christ and his glory may fill all of us. Every one of us. And all the things that we do in the church. This is Christ's kingdom. Church is his body. Church people are his subjects and servants. And every one of us are trophies of his glory. Together, we magnify the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not about any of us, but all about Jesus, who saved us, washed us with his blood, sanctified us with his word, empowered with his spirit, and gave us the hope of eternal heaven. And we come always to glorify our Savior. And when you come that way, dear church, the Lord will fill you with his glory. He will not hold back his glory. His glory is for the church. And so much so that Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 1.23, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The fullness of Christ, not drips and drabs. The fullness of Christ. Filleth what? All. Who are these all? Everyone who is saved and brought into the church. In all. In all things. Look, dear church, Gethsemane. And may all other churches of Christ everywhere hear the same truth. It's for them too. We are very precious in the sight of Christ, our Savior. He deal with us like his own body. He is our head. We are his body. And we are called to be filled with the fullness of Christ in all things. Your personal affairs, your business, your study, your family, your activities in the world, your contributions in the church being empowered by the Holy Spirit's gifts, 
everything we do, our singing, our prayer, our reading of the scripture, our greeting of one another, our hospitality toward our, one another, our prayers, all these are to be filled with the glory of God. And the Bible says, in the church alone this happens. Now the Lord has blessed us with a congregation such as this, which increases by God's grace every week and every month as the Lord adds souls to the church. The Lord also blessed us with a new church session made up of elders and deacons. And it must be our earnest desire See how God wants us to function as his body. That his glory may shine through us. This must be the concern of every elder, every deacon and every member. How does the Lord fill us with his glory in all things that we do? It's not about a spark of your knowledge that you show off. It's not that somebody knows how to play piano or somebody knows a little bit of accounts or somebody knows a little bit of electric wiring or PS system or they know how to manage the digital stuff. I mean, these are not the things that matters the most. Even if these things are useful, they are utterly unprofitable if they are not submitted to the glory of Christ. You may be an accomplished pianist. You may be an uh, eloquent preacher. You may be a very wealthy person. But look, if you ever bring those things to show off your knowledge or your skill, they are utterly unprofitable. So those who are called into the offices of the church the elders and deacons, and all of us who have joyfully elected them or supported them in their service, must pray now. For thy glory, Lord, we exist in the church, in our given places, not for ourselves, for there is nothing but foolishness within us, but in thy wisdom, May we grow together to do your goodwill. And I want to once again emphasize this point. God will not ask the governments of this world to preach the gospel. God will not ask the universities of this world to train pastors and send preachers. God puts his spirit in his church, equip the members of the church with spiritual gifts that are necessary to fulfill all his purpose on earth. And you, my dear brother, my dear sister, if you are a true believer in Christ, if you are genuinely baptized into Christ, which is a token of your inward faith to Christ, then rejoice. Everything you do, no matter how small it may be, in the measure of man, it's never small because God gave you the grace to do it for his glory. We have a high calling in Christ, so we come together. Let's see how Apostle Paul wanted this to be carried out in the church in the book of Philippians. So let's get back to Philippians chapter 1. First of all, let's look at the leadership and their role within the church. The leadership of the church and their roles. Beginning with Paul and Timothy. Paul was an apostle. As we know, in Ephesians chapter 2, we are told that the apostles laid the foundation. 
And so the Lord revealed the truth, the New Testament through the apostles, and that is the foundation. Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. All the truths that God revealed in, through the apostles are for the glory of Christ. And they are held together in Christ. He is the cornerstone. And so here you have Paul, right at the beginning of the verse, who write this epistle, who wrote this epistle. And then you have the name Timothy. Now, Timothy was a disciple of Paul. He was a man of distinguished faith, a man of consecrated life to Christ, a young fellow. Since Paul met him and took him on his missionary journey, Timothy remained very faithful to the Lord and to Paul. And please take note, the Bible doesn't say Timothy and Paul, but Paul and Timothy. Timothy is an important person in the team of the apostles, and yet he is not the apostle. Paul was. There is an order in the Lord's church, everyone in his place, though we are equal as children of God, God does put responsibilities on people. And everyone must learn to hold his ground and not to usurp the authorities, the positions that God has given to others. There is a beauty in God's order. I think it would look very ugly if this letter began by saying Timothy and Paul. It must be this way, Paul and Timothy, because Paul is the leader. Timothy is the follower, and both follow Christ. Why I said that? Look at the next phrase. Paul and Timothy, what? The servants of Jesus Christ. Everyone in the church has a place, and their place is servanthood. They are all servants of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't say, Timothy is my servant. He could have said that, but he didn't. He took lead and said, Timothy, follow me, because we are servants of Jesus Christ. When God calls a man to the leadership of the church, he must always remember his ultimate task is to call the rest to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. As a pastor, my greatest duty is to point you to Christ. I will wait until that noise is over. Yeah, thank you. That's sometimes the problem of our digital technology. They all, always try and make noise. Um, I try my very best to turn off my sound, even of the laptop I use on the pulpit, uh, because I know it can go off like that. It will shock us. No, don't worry. We understand. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> we are all servants of Christ. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by saying servants of Jesus Christ? We are ministers. This word is also translated as ministers. We are always ready to render ourselves in obedience to the will of Christ. I told you already in my introduction that church is the place on earth where Christ seek to exercise his authority. He wouldn't tell the world to obey him because they are lost in sin. And the God of this world is Satan. They follow their prince. 
But the head of the church is Jesus Christ. And everyone in the church is expected to give absolute allegiance and obedience to Christ. It is a total devotion that is expected. Now we are going to have a consecration service. And in that service what we are going to do is simply read the scriptures that remind the elders and deacons of their duties. And then we will pray for them. But this ceremony does not consecrate them by itself. Unless everyone in the board of elders and in the session, including the deacons, give their heart to absolute obedience to Christ. And this is particularly noticeable in the rest of that verse when Paul says Paul and Timothy the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons nobody is excluded from this idea of servanthood all the saints and then his sites particularly bishops and deacons by the way the word bishop in Greek, episkopos is a synonym for presbyteros or elder. Bishops uh, in, in its root word simply means one who have the oversight of the people. One who oversee the work of Christ. He is the one who takes care. And now we are mindful that the elders and deacons... Now, this is the only passage that I know in the New Testament where both roles are put together. So the churches were led by elders and deacons. And that's why we are Presbyterians. The Presbyterians are not Episcopalians where one bishop takes control. But where bishops in plural and deacons together take care of the administration of the church. That's biblical. We are not congregational churches where the people has the power and they vote for one man and the one man runs it, which is a pastor. And maybe they have deacons. It's not one bishop and many deacons. It's bishops and deacons. Now I have in other occasions taught you, but just to remind all of you and of course the new ones in our midst, uh, put your finger here and turn to 1 Timothy 5.17. 1 Timothy 5.17. Let the elders that rule well be counted Worthy of double honor. Let me just stop for a short while and explain. Let the elders, again in plural. Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus because Timothy was in Ephesus at that time. And he says, let the elders that rule. So elders has called to rule, have the oversight of the church. They are in charge of the administrations, not deacons, but elders. Deacons never usurp the authority that God has vested in the elders. One of the things that I tragically saw happening in some Bible Presbyterian churches in recent days were deacons outvote the elders. They shout and scream at elders and pastors. It's a shame. Elders are to rule. Deacons carry out the decisions. Yes, you can contribute your suggestions. You can bring up things that are of much concern, but always with the spirit of submission. And here says, the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Now again, now I speak to the elders. The elders are to rule well, not rule badly. 
We must be good rulers. How can it be a good rule if it is not in obedience to Christ? The good rule of the church, the good management of the church, is the fruit of absolute obedience to God's will. If an elder go about wanting to fulfill his ideas, he is not a good elder. He is not an elder that rule well. He is an elder who selfishly carry out his evil, selfish motives. But uh, an elder who prays to the Lord, wait upon the Lord, apply the scripture in all matters of God's church, is a good elder. And he will rule well. He may not have a man-pleasing face. You know, the smiling, always politically correct smile and appearance. He may look firm. He may not look handsome. He may not have the charisma and persona. But if his heart is given wholly to God, we have a wonderful elder in our church. We thank God for all four elders we have. Elder Ma, Elder Alan Choi, Elder Pocock, who has just joined us as an elder, and myself. And God has given us four elders, and we must pray for them, that they will not anyhow rule, but rule well under the headship of Christ. We are not actual rulers. We are here to implement the rule of Christ. And so we, as board of elders, must be always concerned, what does the Lord say to us? Elders, let's remember that. Okay, If I ever forget, remind me. If we have issues to deal with, let's say, what does the Lord say about this? If one elder asks another elder, what is your opinion? Let him say, I shall seek the Lord. Or I think this is what we could do. Let's pray about it. Let's never show off anything that we have attained by our learning, our experience. True elders, elders who rule well, are those who always acknowledge the headship of Christ and his will in the matters of the church. And so when you look at 1 Timothy 5.17, we are told that we must have elders that rule well, and they, church, listen, you must give them what? Double honor, because they are worthy of double honor. Because it's not hard, it's not easy to find people who are so preoccupied with the rule of Christ. They are of a very special nature, which Jesus gives to the church. They are God's gift. They are appointed by the Holy Spirit. They're not perfect people. But at the same time, I must warn the elders, don't take it lightly. If you are going to be unfaithful, the Lord is going to remove you. And that's for sure. And it's shame on you. And I do understand some elders who do not carry out the duty with wholeheartedness and refined um, mindset would often confuse the people in the church. And they wonder whether this elder is worthy of honor because there are dishonorable way of conduct in them. And may we never be like that. Let all elders remember the office is that which requires double honor from the people. So I cannot lower the honor of that office with my sham religion and unholy and undedicated behavior. Let's hold our office very high because the Lord through his spirit says it's worthy of double honor. But he also said, the un double honor belongs to elders that rule well. Not elders who rule, but elders who rule well. Others, there is no double honor. It's a high calling. 
And also it says in verse 17, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So there are some elders whom the Lord call not only to rule, but at the same time to labor in the word and doctrine. In other words, they are called to be teachers. Full time, laboring, always to study the word of God and to teach. And they are called pastors. So there are elders, and among the elders, there are what we call teaching elders, who, whom the Lord has called to labor always in the word of God. And in that regard, for the glory of God, I acknowledge my calling, which is a gift of God's grace, not my own making. And may God give us more teaching elders in times to come. But all elders must be able to carry out the truth of God so they must know the word of God well. Now they are to be assisted by deacons. Let's come back to Philippians 1. So we call ourselves Presbyterians because we believe church must be led by a group of elders who rule well. And look, elders, may God give us the glory of Christ that we may rule well. Let's look toward it. Have a very high calling, very high calling. And deacons, you stand by the elders, praying for them, administering the duties that God gives to you through the elders, and do it well. Now let me tell you, the carrying out of God's rule Firstly, begin in our individual realm, in our hearts. When elders do not apply the word in their own heart, they are going to be very unruly elders. And secondly, you must, you must administer God's word in your house, in your families. You must take leadership, as 1 Timothy 3 reminds us, if you do not rule your house well, how can, you be, how can you be rulers of God's house? And we must have faithful children. And I know there are good preachers, God servants, who disagree with me on this point. That they say that if your children are adults, uh, even if they become unbelievers and unruly and they live the way they want to live, then you are not responsible. They made the decision as an adult. So even though they live in disobedience and unruliness, you can still remain as elders. I differ. Righteous life and unfaithful life cannot be attributed to a toddler or a young boy or a young girl. That sort of disobedient, righteous life belongs to those who have reached adulthood. And I truly believe, if I don't have the gift of God in me to take care of my own family, then I don't have the gift of God to take care of the church of God. I say this with much fear, for I know my children are still growing. And they can wander away. And that puts me on the, in the right place. To cry for my children's salvation. I believe they are saved by the grace of God. And I believe this is the case with all our elders. That the children are saved and they walk in the way of the Lord. But our duty is not over, elders. We must look after our wives. We must care for them. We must love them. We must nurture them. They are not perfect people. So every elder must apply the rule of Christ in himself, in his family, and then God will give us grace to look after the church. The one who is unfaithful in small things cannot be trusted with greater things. And this is significant. And so I say to the deacons, we are servants of Jesus Christ together. 
So all things that are applied in the spiritual realm for elders, it is applied to you also. Now I say to the saints of God in the church, all that are expected of the elders and deacons are expected of you. God never says in any portion of his word, or oh, some of the church members are allowed to live an unruly life. We are all servants of Jesus Christ together. Well, you can, I pray this, that all of us would be able to say, we thank God for our deacons and elders who serve the Lord Jesus Christ by their life, with the families and with the church, and we will follow them. May God give this joy to us. And this must be our prayer. Only then we are consecrated servants of God. Unfortunately, many churches are falling into the tragedy of unbiblical leadership. There are men who never look after their family for the Lord's sake. In the business of earning a living and making themselves rich, they have not guided the ways of the children and family in the way of the Lord. And the houses are wrecked with unbelief and unholiness. And then they are given duties in the church to guide the hearts of the people in the way of the Lord. Many a time they drastically fail. But if they have survived, it's only God's grace. But God's grace cannot be cited as an excuse to continue in disobedience. Now, at the same time, I want to say this to you because it's necessary. Because the Lord has given us a leadership or elders where the families walk in the way of the Lord, let's don't be arrogant and cocky and say, look, our church is better. We have a perfect church with a perfect leadership. No, 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 no. Not at. Even though we have elders who rule over the house, they're still not perfected at. I know that. My children are not perfect. I'm not perfect. So there is a great need of humility which accepts the reality of our imperfections. And so we must pray, Lord, may ourselves and our leaders and our families grow daily, day by day, turning away from our sins to serve Jesus Christ. Timothy and Paul, oh, sorry, I said it wrong. Paul and Timothy, yes, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Now, let me pick up that word, saints in Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus, what does that imply? We are a gathering of those who are made righteous, made holy by the blood of Christ, by the righteousness of Christ. Nobody in the church has been uh, enlisted in the church because of his personal holiness. You are not here because you have proved him, himself, yourself to be a perfect man or perfect woman. But you have trusted in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you came saying, I'm a sinner, oh wretched sinner, out of my bondage of sin and darkness. Here I come, Jesus, put thy righteousness on me that I may be acceptable to God, that God may deal with me like a saint. But I am not a saint. Only in Christ Jesus. So every Christian in the church must constantly remember his place in the church is a gift of Christ. He covers us with his righteousness. He hides us in his goodness and perfect righteousness. And in him alone we are saints. And at the same time, remember, once we are called into Christ, there we must remain as his saints. It's not for us to wander away. 
It's ours to run quickly into Him. It is ours to abide in Christ. If we ever step out in disobedience, we will be utterly unholy. And please remember, this is a name for all in the church, not for some in the church. It's not a name for bishops and deacons alone or Paul and Timothy alone. It's for all, all the saints, all of you. I, oh, how I, I wish, how I pray, how I yearn to see that in you, there is this absolute awareness that I belong to Jesus and I am surrounded, I am wrapped up in the righteousness of Christ. You know, when you become a saint in Christ, the righteousness of God that covers you is not some sort of concept. It's a reality. There is this tight wrapping and the beauty of that righteousness, its glow, its glory, it's so great that you are so overtaken by it and you don't want to go out of it. It's a beautiful dwelling. As we sang before the worship in pre-worship singing, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. What's that? It's in the righteousness of God. Where sin cannot molest us. Where Satan cannot invade us. Where the beauty and the glory of Christ keeps us. Oh, that secret place of the righteousness of Christ. Now I know. Now I know. Why I'm in the church is to be wrapped up in the glory of Christ. His glory is not carnal, it's not temporal, it's not transient, but it's the infinite holiness of Christ. And there I dwell as a saint. The moment I step out of it, the moment I forget my Savior, there I plunge into the miry clay of sin. I, I must stay until, dear church, we repent from our sins and rejoice in the righteousness of Christ. We cannot fully enjoy the glory of Christ that he wants to give to our church. I'm not saying that if somebody has fallen, God will not uh, use the church. God may still use us. But it is so important for you to know that we cannot wander from Christ who loved us. And we must always come to him and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for counting me as your child and giving me the inheritance of the saints. And in thee I will dwell. If every one of you come into this church, elders, deacons, and members, and then we live in the knowledge that Christ is all in all, and we have our righteousness that enable us to serve the Lord through Christ, our, Christ, our righteousness without Christ is nothing but a filthy garment. But because we come in the righteousness of Christ, we have for ourselves the perfect righteousness that Jesus gives to us. And so I can serve him. And so it will be thankfulness that brings us to serve him. It will be the joy of his eternal gift of his righteousness and salvation that make us servants. And we humbly serve. We don't serve because we are bishops. We don't serve because we are deacons. We serve because we are 
saints. And that alone gives us the right to serve. If you are not made righteous in the, by the death of Christ, you cannot be a servant. On your own, you are not a servant. Only in Christ. So there is nothing for us to glory in ourselves. But we shall glory in Christ, who is our blessed Savior, a wonderful shepherd, and we shall follow him. And if we ever been alerted to our sins, if we have ever been told of our sins, our weaknesses, we will immediately say, no, this cannot be. This cannot be. I cannot be in that way. I must change. Humbly repent. Self-justification will not make us righteous. But repentance and casting of ourselves into his hand. I want to remind all the elders and deacons and members of the church. There will be times when our sins will be addressed. Our weaknesses will be told to us. Please do not flare up in your pride. Try to cover your shortcomings and sins. If you do so, you dishonor Christ who says repent. Confess your sins. I will cleanse you. That's a sure recipe to take yourself out of the service of Christ. We are often reminded by those who serve the Lord with love and passion that we have not the same passion. It's time to repent. Sometimes we are told of our sin by a loving brother or sister who sharply tell us how we have gone wrong. We must repent. Not defend ourselves for a second. Yes, of course, there are false accusers. There are people who try to pull us down. Then we just tell the fact and we thank God for the grace of God in us which help us to be different. Not as they say. We thank God. I'm not asking you to give up your integrity. Of course not. You don't have to take upon a crime that you have not committed. But if there is any reason for any sin that is to be rebuked, then let's as saints of God quickly Say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, brother. Thank you for reminding me. I will change. And I desire to see this in our church session. I desire to see this among our preachers. I desire to see this in our congregation. Because without it, without an appreciation for the sanctity that God gives to us, we cannot be servants. Let me make it very clear to you. Without holiness, you cannot see God. Without holiness, you cannot serve God. Without holiness, you cannot rule the church. Simple as that. There must be individual holiness. There must be holiness in our families. And there must be holiness in our church. There is no place for anyone to sit on his pride. And justify his weaknesses and shortcomings. Quickly bow. Then we know you are true church of Jesus Christ. We know this is a high calling. And so Paul tells them. Grace, and, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our resource. Grace and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a huge task. We are sinners. We are prone to wander. We are rid with foolishness. We often fail. Our shortcomings stare at us. How would we ever have a victorious life? How would we ever able to do such an honorable duty that is given to us? To be saints of God. To be servants of Jesus Christ. Yes, it's by the enabling grace that forgives our sins and equips us. And as a result, 
peace will be given. Often I wonder why I'm called to be a pastor. Because I think on my own I'm unworthy. On my own I'm unworthy. And I wonder at the marvelous grace that God has extended to me to be a preacher and pastor. And that gives me peace. Ah, the grace of God, not me. If it's me, I have no peace. But the knowledge that is gracious, it gives me great peace to be a Christian, to be a pastor. Thank God for his grace. So, my dear brothers, elders, deacons, and the church, grace is our source of peace that we need to serve him undisturbed. You know, in the, in the service of God, we need great calmness because there will be a lot of things there to disturb us. Too many things, I don't want to mention them. There's so many things, sins of ours, sins of others, our lack of knowledge, everything can disturb us. But the peace that comes from the grace of God stabilizes our heart. Sometimes we, we find ourselves struggling with sickness and trials. We thank God for the grace that says my grace is sufficient. And then I shall look at my work and say, Lord, I shall peacefully face it. You will be my strength. And so God, thank God for the grace. And now the second thing is this. The means. The source is grace in serving God. And the means of serving together is memory, remembrance. Sanctified memory. Not, not, not unholy memory. There is an unholy memory. Let me just say that, what it is. After we get saved, sometimes we think of the sins we committed last time. It's a very dangerous thing. Let's say there were some people who were adulterous, who live in fornication, sexual sins. After being saved, two years later, he look back and think about all those rubbish they did as something sweet. Oh, dangerous. It's an unholy memory. It's like the Egyptians who came out of Egypt with Moses. When they saw the trials, they complained against Moses, said, Is it not because we don't have food in Egypt that you brought us out? Oh, we remember about the Egyptian onions. <laughs> that was sweet. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They couldn't look at the promised land that was filled with milk and honey. There is a bad memory, memory of sin, memory that is wrecked by wickedness of our life with fleshly lust. That is no good. But we have this, we must have this kind of memory that Paul displays. A sanctified memory. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. What does he remember? The people in the church. Oh, it's wonderful how God changed people. Remember, see what he remembers. And he goes on to say, in every prayer of mine for you. Oh, where does he remember? When he sits before God, when he sits before God to pray, he will remember the people in the church. The saints of God, the bishops and deacons, Timothy and every co-laborer comes to his mind. And then he says, in every prayer of mine, I make requests with joy for you all and for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. He says to the Philippines, you know, from the very first day I met you, you have been constantly serving the Lord and the cause of the gospel with me. And that makes me so happy and I praise God. I'm not thinking about your weakness. I'm not thinking about your past. But I am thinking about the fellowship you offer to the, to the work of the gospel. This is significant. 
Sometimes there are things that upset me in this church. It can be the weakness of a brother or the foolish behavior of a young person. But I pray that the Lord will help them to grow. When I see the change, when I see they have a heart for the Lord, I have to thank God for that. We cannot be in bitterness. We must have a sanctified memory of people. And may we also pray that we will be a reason for others' joy, just as the Philippians were the joy of Paul in prayer. You must pray. You must be the joy of your pastors, your elders, your preachers. And you must be a joy to others. When they sit down and think about the church, they can thank God for you. Let not a person shed a tear of unhappiness because of you. It's a very bad thing. If we are like that, well, this is the outcome. Verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. That which he hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The outcome is that God will fulfill it. It's after all his church. He has begun the work. The work of salvation which brings us together as a group of saints and make us labor together. He makes some of us elders, some of us deacons, the rest of us to co-labor and together as servants of Christ, we serve him. Now this shows that the work of God in us has begun. So he has begun the work to save us and to gather us and to use us as his church. will complete it, perform it, until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, church has a very big hope. We are never pes pessimistic people. Get so many. We must be optimistic in Christ. We are not afraid of our trials. We are not afraid of our enemies. We are not afraid of our challenges. Because we know it is God who worketh in us. And we are just his servants. If our God liveth forever, if he reigneth supreme over the church, if he is ever willing and seeking to fill his goodness and his glory in us, then I cannot fail. He will perform it. I'm not a work of my own. I'm a work of my master. This church is not our work, but the Lord's work. And he will never fail in his work. He will perform it. Ah, let's watch it. Let's yield ourselves so we may see the Lord's work in us in, in, as individuals and as families and as a church. Together, if we honor the Lord, the Lord will honor us by accomplishing His great work in us. So let us now prepare our hearts for the rest of the worship. Ashes, would you please let the Chinese congregation brothers to come in?